Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to our event this evening with um, Routina's repertoire and our gallery opening was last week. Tonight we have some amazing programming for you um, from uh, some of our artists and curators. I wanna say thank you to all of the attendees and all of the panelists tonight. It's so wonderful to have more than 50 people out seeing art this evening. And I think you're in for a treat of an evening. Um, before we get started, I'm Amy Erickson. I'm the executive director here at Angels Gate Cultural Center. It's so nice to see you all in this uh, webinar room. Um, and we look forward to having a fun evening with you um, to talk about the work that is in our gallery. We hope soon we will be able to allow people in to see this amazing work, but right now it is up on our website under our virtual galleries, and we hope you all go take a part in, in that. Before I hand this over to the amazing Cecilia Coger, I would like to just um, thank our relatives. I wanna recognize that we live and work on the traditional and sacred lands of the Tongva, the Kitsch, the Ahachaman, and the Chumash, and the many other indigenous groups who call these grounds home. I wanna honor and extend our gratitude to all of the original people still living in this region. It's so important um, that we honor the space we are in here at Angels Gate. So, have a wonderful evening. I'll be on here for a little while and I look forward to uh, seeing all of you later on this year at some of our virtual and hopefully non-virtual events. Here you go, Cecilia. Hi everyone, I'm Cecilia Coger. I'm the program manager at Angels Gate Cultural Center. Uh, thank you again for being here tonight. And uh, also thank you to the people who are here in another time zone. Uh, we appreciate all the wonderful people who come uh, from Singapore and some other areas. Um, yeah, yeah, so thank you so much. Um, and before uh, we sort of uh, move on to the main portion of this programming, I just wanna say that this is in conjunction uh, with our gallery exhibitions. Uh, currently we have a fantastic show, uh, Borderline, and I'm gonna quickly introduce the curator from Borderline. Uh, her name is Naomi and she is gonna be with you uh, in a minute. Uh, Naomi Stewart is an independent curator and poet based in Los Angeles, California. She received her Bachelor of Arts in Anthropology at Hawaii Pacific University, Honolulu in 2018. Her mission, first and foremost, is to give voice to people's stories and to help cultivate their passions in meaningful and culture-defining ways. In her practice, she is interested in giving platforms to emerging artists, engaging in community activism while addressing themes surrounding holistic healing, identity, and human persistence. These themes take presence in her practice as she currently founded um, doxa underscore exhibit on Instagram, housing a series of online exhibitions. In addition to the borderline exhibition, she co-curated co -curated the emergent exhibition with Super Collider Gallery. She currently serves as a co-curator for Inbreak Residency uh, with DS Studios. So uh, with that, I'd like to pass it over to uh, Naomi. Thank you so much, Cecilia. And good evening. Thank you all for coming. Thank you to Angels Gate Cultural Center for hosting this event. Um, as she mentioned, my name's Naomi Stewart. I am a Black woman with short hair, and I'm currently sitting at my desk for those who may not be able to see me. I am one of the curators for Borderline, as Cecilia mentioned, and I'll be moderating this discussion led by one of our artists in Borderline, which is Wing Song Seat. Tonight, we will discuss her uh, online and physical installation of Routine as Repertoire. In this ongoing project, Son uses photography and videos to explore routines that women and non-binary people incorporate into their lives as their bodies go through transformations or challenges. Within the context of the borderline exhibition, we are exploring the notion of a border, both as a metaphor for our lived experience and as a tool to undermine the certainty of the territories it defines. By occupying this in-between space that exists between two distinct conditions, we defiantly trespass into this adjacent space, break down conventional barriers and explore new territories. Routine's repertoire plays a significant role in exploring the distinction between the abled and those in transformation who face physical challenges. 
The nuances of one's identity in light of their transition takes form in their sense of place. We see through each participant's routines the struggle with the static public built with only the able-bodied in mind, thus creating a barrier that many of our participants here tonight have had to navigate in light of their physical and mental transformations and challenges. Through the documentation of these intimate routines, San has captured this in-between space of the public and the private, the able-bodied and those whose bodies have transformed or have faced these challenges. So given the subject matter, this work in Borderline is presented um, with images from and text descriptions of the work. Due to the nature of this <laughs> exhibition and uh, the message we were trying to tell, um, maybe Amy, since you are here, you can speak to a little bit as to uh, the accessibility fight at uh, Angel's Gate. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Naomi. And I appreciate that we have this work up in some way to um, accentuate what is, um, what is going on with a space that is over 100 years old. So Angel's Gate is on the upper reservation of Fort MacArthur. These are army bases that were commissioned in the 20s. And, um, and we have been in the space for now over 40 years um, as Angel's Gate Cultural Center. We are always trying to make this as, as accessible as possible. Our galleries and offices are really in one of the only two up, uh, two story buildings on our campus. That means the upstairs has stairs you have to go up. And um, I've been there for 11 years now and we've been trying to navigate this um, a possibility. How could we get people up to the upstairs that um, can't walk up those stairs on their own? So um, we have done some work around that. The park has done some work around that. With, with ADA law the way that it is right now, what we know is that to make that completely ADA accessible, we would also have to do it to the 11 other buildings of our campus and um, to about 32 other buildings on the Angels Gate Park. So at this moment, it's not a possibility, but if you do get a chance to come into our galleries, we do have uh, virtual galleries set up for each of our um, shows. And there's a kiosk on the downstairs level that you can roll right up to or come to and see what is happening on the upstairs so that you're, um, we're trying to make these po things possible. So I appreciate you, um, San, for um, really thinking about how we can address this in the show and, and Naomi and the other curators, I appreciate it. Thanks so much, Amy. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And yes, yeah, so in light of that, we decided, uh, San and I decided to show it in this way, where we show a couple of examples from the project, which we'll see more of. And um, she wrote a little bit about the project. So if you do come to see it in person, you can hear in the words of artists um, what this means to her. And so I'm happy to moderate this discussion. Um, tonight, we'll hear from five participants from Rutina's repertoire out of the 27 and counting that San filmed and interviewed. Um, throughout this discussion, we'll have 10, about 10 minutes of question and answer. So please feel free to submit your questions that we'll answer in the question and answer portion at the end. And now it's my pleasure to present, oh, I should mention there's also closed mm -hmm. captioning available. So go ahead, if you look at the bottom right hand corner, you should be able to turn on the closed captions. And at this time, I'd like to present Wang Song Seat. Uh, she is a Singaporean artist and educator who is based in LA and Singapore. Her work investigates the systems and power structures that create the dissonance between attentive, homogenous representations of marginalized bodies versus the reality of complex and multifaceted identities, often the foundation of deeply entrenched inequalities. San, I'm interested and we're all interested to, for you to tell us what inspired you to pursue this project and how it has impacted you personally in your practice. Thank you, Amy and Cecilia from Angel's Gate and to everyone who is tuning in from a different time zone. Uh, I'm a yellow skinned woman, long black hair, wearing something colorful and um, yeah, and I'm sitting at my desk. So uh, going back to Naomi's question, the idea for routine as repertoire came perhaps two years ago. Um, 
And uh, when after I was diagnosed with uh, early stage cancer, uh, when I was thrown into a sudden change in my body um, that doctors didn't really prepare me for. Um, when I was barely awake uh, after my surgery, I could feel uh, a wave of heat rushing through and that was hot flash from the surgical menopause. Um, welcome to the new reality. Uh, that was the beginning of constantly navigating the different changes um, and often frustration at the routines that I needed to incorporate to deal with these changes. Because of my own uh, experiences, I also had the opportunity to connect and speak with other women who have faced their own challenges in their bodies. Uh, one thing that often comes up at, is that many felt that they were being viewed solely based on their condition, which is often a result of very polarized narratives, tragedy or heroism. Either the individual becomes invisible um, and the word cancer, menopause quietens and become the elephant in the room where parents rush their children when they ask about the wheelchair or they are put on the um, pedestal, like what Vanessa, I think in our conversation, we spoke about um, inspiration porn. If they can do it, so can you. Um, bringing forth unrealistic expectations for them to live up to. So, um, so this in turn, result in the othering, a separation between those who have impairment and those without, creating a failure to see that we are entitled to equal rights to accessibility in every aspect of our lives, and that those who have been othered bring value to the world um, in different but no less important way. The transformations or challenges in our bodies when we experience illnesses, disabilities, aging, motherhood, and gender transi transitioning is a part of us, but not a definition of who we are. And I decided to film everyday, often banal routines to hopefully see things as they are, um, that for every individual, a whole gamut of experiences exists beyond tragedy and heroism. Um, they are complex and different between even those with the same diagnosis. You know, uh, with, with sadness comes with sadness, fear and anger comes courage, joy and humor. With vulnerability comes enormous resilience and creativity. So uh, showing these routine also speak to labor, to the work that is being done for care, uh, which in itself is a radical act of self-determination. In the exhibition, I also try to emphasize that routine and care should not be a site where we execute judgment. They differ in meaning and form between culture, lived experiences, and class. And that some routines are possible only with uh, privilege. They definitely go beyond hashtag self-care on Instagram. So some choose not to have a routine and the inability to stick to a routine should not define us either. Um, taking, you know, so taking care, taking Pills are care routines, so it's cleaning and building community. I also cannot emphasize enough that this work is not possible without those who came before me, be it through books, chats with strangers, etc. And every single person who participated in the project has shared wisdom um, and coping hacks and allowed me the confidence to take this self-portrait, um, the self, I think that's before. Yeah, the image before um, that I would not have made two years ago. So I want to just um, give a shout out and say their names. Um, Alicia, Ng Chueng, Veronica Yap, Wendy Tankwa, Susan Trackman, Eva Sweeney, Vivian Stencil, Anna Stump, Erica Franco, uh, Jacqueline Romain, Jessica Lee, Ko Wai Heng, which is my grandmother, Shannon Kiro, Moya Devin, Amruta Meta. Linda Song, Pika Sen, Wendy New, Susan Sensler, Celeste Yap, Vanessa Cruz, Nico Chan, Lois Chan, Sherry Soon, and I'm part of the participant. So, um, and thank you so much for that. And uh, next slide. 
So the the this is just a very quick view of what the exhibition online exhibition consists, and hopefully you can take a look at them. Um, they consist of a mix of interviews, videos, and this is a short snippet of them. This is uh, Anna. So, uh, and these light paintings where attached lights to each person's body or assistant technology is a response to Frank Gilbert's image of repetitive labor to increase efficiency at the workspace. But this time, the care routines are made on their own terms. Um, next slide, please. So this is a very quick run through of, you know, this is how a brief section of what the exhibition uh, looks like. So go onto the website and hopefully you explore and I look forward to hearing your um, ideas and feedback. So next slide, please. So without further ado, I would like to introduce, um, I would like to invite each of our panelists to introduce themselves and share some of the routines with us. We'll start off with Vivian Stencil, and of course she's here today with her lovely husband, Turner. Um, and this next slide, well, um, next slide, please. Uh, this is um, a long exposure of Vivian swimming at 5 a.m. in the morning. And, and we can have, uh, while we play this video in the background, Vivian, uh, Vivian do you want to say something? Uh, you can start introducing yourself. Yes, I'm uh, Vivian Stansel, married to Turner Stansel, have three children, have um, grandchildren and great grandchildren. My routine for the day, every day, regardless if it's Saturday or Sunday, I get up at 3.30 in the morning. I kind of prepare myself. I have my moment of meditation. And at 4.30, I'm out of the house at the uh, swim complex. Also, Turner helps me put on my fins and everything. Some of the things I like, I love swimming. I am one of the world medalist swimmers for the state of California. I swim all over the world. I haven't tried the country yet, but I I'm a competitive swimmer with 270 medals and I'm visually impaired. I don't believe that um, you can't do something when someone tells me I can't. I prove to them that I can. I enjoy cooking. I make, uh, uh, what is that? Eggplant lasagna. I eat healthy. And the reason why I do that is because I used to weigh 320 pounds. I'm interviewed with all kinds of celebrities now across the United States, you know. And so I enjoy sharing to women uh, that they can make it. I try to find out what is their purpose first and I kind of mentor them. And that's what I do. Thank you, Vivian. Um, we'll go on to 
can we have the slide? Uh, Susan. And uh, this is an image of Susan uh, filling her pills. This is one of the long exposure. Um, and also the next slide shows the artwork that she makes. Uh, she's an artist uh, that relates to her treatment and her routines. And the next slide. Yeah, so this is some of uh, Susan's uh, artwork that she put in her house. She colors her some of her scans. And without further ado, um, we can have uh, Susan introduce herself. <laughs> Hi, um, so I am a white woman, a very white woman right now because I haven't been able to get out into the sun. Um, I'm wearing a black sweater and a burgundy knit hat. I'm a wife, um, I'm a mother, a friend, an artist, and a woman who's had MS for over 30 years. And initially, when I was diagnosed, I had a very mild case. Um, over the years, um, it has changed and progressed. And consequently, so have my routines and um, I've had to adapt. And so, one of the routines that you saw that I do weekly is load my pill boxes and um, very tedious thing, um, but I, I do it. And I actually turned it into a piece of art as well um, to make it uh, fun. Um, I also play Mahjong once a week. Um, which is something I do that's good for both my psyche and my brain. And it's also allows me to socialize. Um, I'm not as mobile as I once was. Um, right now, nobody's that mobile. So fortunately there's online Mahjong. So um, not only am I able to play once a week, with the friends I normally play with, but I'm even able to play with people um, in other states, which is added bonus. And I also use my art um, as a way to kind of work through my feelings. And I have an art day and art, a buddy, a good friend of mine, we get together once a week and we we work on things and work through things. And it's very, very um, helpful. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Susan. Sure. Um, thank you. And uh, the next will be Wendy Tan Kwa, uh, who is uh, now calling in from Singapore. And uh, Wendy began doing long walks um, uh, after her diagnosis with cancer. Can we move to the next? Yeah, so this is a long exposure uh, of her walking back to her office. So I went with her on one of her walks and um, this is close to where her office is. And uh, next image. Yeah, so... Um, Wendy also takes some uh, traditional Chinese medicine. And, and we'll now have Wendy uh, introduce yourself. And the next slide, please. Yeah. Oh, can we reduce the sound? I don't know why the sound is out, but yeah, okay. So, uh, Wendy, yeah. Hello. Hello. We need. We cannot see you. Can you put the uh, show your? The host has not. Oh, okay. Yeah. So show your. Put your camera on. Yes, my camera is on. Oh. But uh, start video, say you cannot start your video because... Oh, okay. Host, uh, okay. 
Ah, okay, okay, we see you now. Hello, hi, greetings from Singapore. My name is Wendy Tan Kua, and uh, I'm a Chinese, Singapore Chinese uh, lady with short black hair, and I'm wearing an orange blouse, uh, wearing go earring, and I'm uh, have a blue background. I'm also 30, 61 years old, married for 41 years, and I have two adult sons. I'm a Buddhist and uh, my religion helps me a lot to cope with my stage 4 uterine leiomyosarcoma cancer. Wendy, can you move back a little bit? Yeah, okay. And then, yeah, I can keep go going. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I was diagnosed with uh, uterine leiomyosarcoma in 2014. I had a full hysterectomy surgery to remove all the female organs and the 5.5 cm tumor, which was hiding behind the left ovary. I was uh, freaking out when I was first diagnosed with stage 4 cancer after the PET CT scan report in January 2015. And um, the diagnosis was like a death sentence because I even told my oncologist, why is it so unfair that I didn't go through stage one, two, and then three or four, but immediately went into stage four. And um, I was devastated and I was uh, very sad. But I was very lucky to have my first sarcoma specialist oncologist who is very well known at that time at National Cancer Center. And he uh, was very blunt with me. And he, but I like him a lot because he tell me real things. Things that it's not very nice to hear, but it helps me a lot. For example, he says obesity. At that time, I was about 260 pounds, or about 118 kg. And he said obesity is number two cancer killer. And so you're so fat. You should do something about your weight. And then he says there's no support group in Singapore specifically for sarcoma uh, patient in Singapore. So he actually gave me a USA Lyomyo Support and Direct Research Foundation and asked me to join them so that I will learn more about Lyomyosarcoma because I don't have a clue what is Lyomyosarcoma or even sarcoma. And um, he also said the gold standard is surgery and chemotherapy does not work well for sarcoma. Only 10% success rate as sarcoma soft tissue is very resistant in chemo. Whatever he told me at that time, stick to my mind and help me with my journey. So instead of crying um, and uh, being sad all the time, I pull myself out of depression. And my sister, my only sister, actually guide me with walking. She actually volunteered to walk with me. And so our first walk at Singapore Botanical Garden were both with both our husbands. It was a very fun walk, slow walk. And they all have to wait for me because less than 500 meters, my tongue was coming out because um, I was too tired. Uh, I am actually a couch potato. And suddenly to have to walk, it takes a lot of my effort. And I was sweating, panting away. But after several walks with my sister, I actually begin to have more stamina and walking is now part of and it's a way of life for me. After six years with this cancer journey, uh, I am no longer the freaking out lady who is so scared of dying. I'm, I'm actually very, very happy every day because this morning, for example, when I wake up, I pray and say, thank you. Thank you for giving me another, yet another day. Because if I tell anybody that I actually have a big tumor of 23 cm in my abdominal area, it's very scary. I only get scared during the time when I do CT scan. If not, I just leave it away and do not want to think about the 
23 cm inoperable tumor. Um, as my oncologist told me that chemo is only 10% success rate. So anyone will know that it's no point doing the chemo. So I've never done chemo in my life. And I only uh, deal with plant-based uh, diet. My routine would be plant-based diet, exercise, exercise, more exercise. And mentally, I always talk to myself and I also talk to my tumors because the tumors are now my friends. We do not, I told them that please don't kill me. We don't kill each other. We keep to, we keep as friends so that we can actually survive. So I'm praying very hard. I'm living with hope. And I pray very hard that my tumor will not grow much bigger than 23 cm. And um, I, I we don't see you. Okay. Can you see me? No. But that, yeah, okay, now I see you. <laughs> Sorry, Sorry yeah. for the interruption. And um, I, I actually joined the support group when the three hospitals in Singapore, KK Woman, Children Hospital, National Cancer Center Singapore, and also the National Cancer Institute of Singapore, NUH, when they collaborate and uh, conduct a first meeting for the Sakoma support group in Singapore in 2016, I volunteered myself to join uh, as the leader of the Sakoma support group because I believe in community. I believe in uh, supporting each other. And uh, this support group will help me as well as help other members to be emotionally supporting each other and also to uh, gain friendship and education. Because by supporting other uh, uh, members, I actually gain strength, hope, uh, and also you know, looking at their difficult decision on various uh, treatments and uh, lymphedema and all this, I actually learn from them more than they learn from me. So okay. having a support group is uh, a very uh, important for the community. So for exercise, I actually walk up to 30 k km. I could walk up to 30 km, but because of lymphedema, my physiotherapy actually request that I slow down and not to walk so much. But every day I still walk because walking is now part of my routine and it, I believe it's a very addic addictive habit now. Yes. And okay. um, thank you. Thank and you. Thank you so much. Uh, and we'll uh, go to the next slide. Uh, Pika um, the next uh, our next guest is Pika Sen with uh, Wendy. The picture, the portrait is Wendy um, on her side. And this is, uh, they are soul sisters and I also filmed Wendy as well. I think Wendy is uh, beside Pika. Um, and this is a image, a light painting in their workspace. So they became uh, colleagues after um, being, you know, uh, fellow survivors and they incorporate um, you know, their, their, their routines of taking care of themselves in their workspace. So they jump on the trampoline with the kids that they work with uh, and so on. So uh, yeah, so this is Pika jumping on the trampoline. Um, so Pika, uh, I'd like to Thank you for coming. I know she's still at work. And hi, Wendy, I see Wendy on the side. Yes, she's right here. Hi, everybody. Lovely to be here and part of this beautiful and poignant work. Thank you so much. My name is Pika Sen. I am a speech and language therapist. And um, uh, following everybody else's descriptions of themselves, I am an Australian-born Indian who lives in Singapore as a permanent resident. So I came to Singapore in 1994 and uh, started work as a speech and language therapist. And uh, in, when I was 43 years of age, I was diagnosed with breast cancer, uh, stage two. 
and I had to go through the entire uh, plethora of treatment, so surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, um, where you, know, you go through the devastation that chemotherapy wreaks on your body. One of the hardest parts for me about the cancer journey was uh, that I lost um, a lot of functionality in my left arm as a result of having all my lymph nodes removed as part of the breast cancer surgery. So um, that was what attracted me to Renaissance Project. Um, I think that uh, the lymphedema journey going through that was actually much more traumatic for me than any of the cancer um, situations that I had to go through. So um, I really felt that lymphedema, the swelling that came in my left arm uh, was one of the things that made my mental health suffer. It made my family relationship suffer because I had to engage in a lot of daily routines to, to manage it. So when I was able to finally get a handle on it um, by a lymphedema cytostomosis, I was just There's another banner. But it's can you me. sit here for me? I go toilet. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Wendy, <laughs> mute. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, going through lymphedema treatment and manual lymphatic massage and all those kinds of things, um, when I wanted to go back to work, I wanted to find a way that I could do those things without being hampered and for it to enhance uh, what I was doing with the children. So I was able to um, curate my space, my working space with the children, such that it gave me a lot of opportunity to reach up and take things so I could stretch out my arm. It gave me a lot of opportunity to bend down and do weight training because when you're picking up children, that's weight training. So um, I try to incorporate all these things in our um, in our ambience and in our space at work. And my colleague Wendy, who is an early childhood educator and a special uh, educator as well, joined me on this journey, and uh, we've together created a space. Come, Wendy. Uh, we've together created a space that works well for us to manage our lymphedema on a daily basis, support each other in our um, daily work with the children where we have to lift them, carry them, bring them, show them, jump with them. So we've got trampolines, we've got things hanging from the ceiling, we've got things um, you know, all over the place where we can incorporate our routines every day with the children. So that's our story, and uh, I'm very grateful to have had the opportunity to work with Belle uh, Wendy and do this together yes. as a team. <laughs> Thank you, Pika. Thank you, Wendy. Um, um, can I have the slide? So uh, last but not least, we have Vanessa. Uh, Vanessa is a dancer, and this is a, you know, we'll show a short clip from the video and she, um, because of COVID, I was unable to film uh, Vanessa. So she provided these footage of her. And uh, she, you know, this is her practicing uh, and performing in at home during COVID. So. Hello. Hi. Vanessa. Hello, um, my name is Vanessa Cruz, pronouns she, her, hers. Um, my brief image description, I am a brown skinned Mexican American woman. I am currently wearing glasses, some makeup, earrings, a sparkly transparent shirt, and there are some blinds behind me. Um, I am a physically disabled dancer, artist, filmmaker, activist, and so much more. I'm really excited to be here with everyone. Um, so I was born with uh, my physical disability. It's called arthrogryposis. Um, the way I define it for myself is basically um, limited joint motions um, and muscle weakness primarily on my legs. So I wear leg braces and I usually use a walker to maneuver around. Um, so one of the things that um, is deeply embedded in my routine is um, warming up my body for my dance practice. I am currently at Cal State Long Beach, um, about to graduate this semester um, to obtain my dance science degree. Super excited. Um, so right now I'm currently training to become a professional dancer, choreographer, artist. Um, so yeah, one of the things that um, that is deeply embedded within my routine is warming up my body as much as I can before a dance class. Um, I do a lot of feet articulation. Um, my version of that um, 
I do a lot of translation of movement when I dance. Um, so that is something that has definitely improved my body over the years. Um, I think if I wasn't a dancer, my body would be completely different. Um, and that, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but I do definitely feel that um, there's a lot more body awareness within, um, within the way I move around the world. Um, I do a lot of yoga as well to maintain my mental health. Um, during this pandemic, it has definitely been a challenge because I have a very small space as you saw in the videos. Um, so I can't really dance a lot with my walker, which has prohibited a lot of the training that I'm usually used to in a dance studio. Um, but I am finding a way to find different exploration and techniques um, to further my artistry. Um, and then I have uh, definitely started becoming more of an activist these past two years. So that is also part of my routine, a practice of doing the work, doing research. Um, a lot of my advocacy comes from the disability justice lens, community care and intersectionality. Um, so I'm doing a lot of that work. Um, and then I've recently started doing a lot of collaging, um, just sort of to have a lot of anxiety. So that kind of grounds me as well. So thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Thank, thank you so much, Vanessa. Um, and so we will, um, thank you everyone. Um, we will t have a, yeah, okay, Naomi is back. <laughs> I was looking for, um, so now we will have a very short discussion um, and the discussion theme would be, uh, why do you, uh, why do we agree to share these often um, personal routines uh, in the public sphere? What does it mean um, to, to bring the personal into the public to you? And why do you, yeah, so why do you agree to, to meet a stranger, you know, when I request it? <laughs> so um, this is open to anyone. So you can, uh, anyone wants to answer first? Yes, this is Vivian. Yes, Vivian. The reason why I do it, because I'm doing it everywhere I go. And it's now come natural with me to speak to strangers. And I, I have such a discerning spirit that I know who not to speak to, but who to speak to, who I feel comfortable with. And that's why I do this because every time I go to a different um, uh, uh, state, you know, I'm always meeting um, people uh, to speak to uh, them about how do I get around with my disability. So that's why I feel comfortable with it. Thank you. Um, yeah, the, the, yeah, Pika. You're, you're on mute. I just wanted to say, um, I just wanted to be part of this wonderful project. And the reason I wanted to share was because um, as women, we need to learn never to trade our authenticity for anybody's approval. So do it. Get out there, show people who you are and what, what you've been through and be proud. Yeah, imagine a woman, you know, who could, who can, you know, we're all sisters here. You know, we've all been through something uh, life-changing so yeah never ever trade what you want uh to what you want to get out there but just because you're shy or scared or worried about what people will think thank you Pika. yeah vanessa yeah um thank you so much for reaching out to me it was i know you reached out to me way earlier yeah um, but <laughs> there's a lot of things happening um mm -hmm. even before the pandemic um, and one of the things that I found interesting about your work is the fact that you're really shedding all these layers that we place upon ourselves before we leave the door out into the world. And our routines is part of our humanness. You're, you're highlighting the human aspects of who we are. And I really thought that's beautiful work. And I think that's something that we are not necessarily comfortable talking about. And I think it's vital to start showcasing these nuances, this vulnerability that um, we don't talk about 
in the dinner table, you know, I think this is vital work that you're doing. Thank you. Any... Yes, Wendy. Hi. Um, for me, I have quite a number of challenges in my life. Uh, one of them is being a caregiver of my firstborn. When he was young, he was labelled as autistic. And I was clueless about what is autistic. In the early 80, uh, in the late 80s, it's no, not many people know what is autistic. And I'm one of them. And so uh, with, I'm a founding member of the Autism Association Singapore. And all these parents were all uh, worried about their children and so am I and uh, based on that challenge and walking as a caregiver for my son uh, sharing is very important because the other parents gave me information to help my child mm. and uh, I give information when I discover something for you know and we were a very close-knitted community and that was long time ago and uh, now when uh, I was diagnosed with cancer I was putting up my hands to join a support group and as I mentioned earlier my oncologist say there's none in Singapore in 2015 when I was diagnosed when I heard in 2016 there's a first meeting for the Sakuma I put up my hand and say let me volunteer I want to join a community because mm -hmm sharing it's very important to me because we learn and we grow so having the cancer diagnosis as a patient it helps me because of my first journey with my child mm -hmm. and I'm very pleased to say that I've been blessed my son is now considered Asperger syndrome instead of autistic he has gone overseas to Australia to study. He has his bachelor degree and his master's degree. And so I would say, never say never. Everything mm -hmm. can be done. You know, it's just that you probably have to have more confidence in yourself, have positive bites. So this is my six years and my tumor, inoperable tumor is 23 cm. When I tell someone, I say, why didn't you want to get it operated? I say, yeah, but they cannot operate me or else I'll die in the theater. So I might sell leave and I'm 61. If I can spend another one, two years, I'll be very happy, okay? Because sarcoma five-year survival rate, I have hit that five-year and I'm still on. And I'm quite blessed that now all the oncologists tell me, oh, your cancer is non-aggressive because I'm still alive. Mm. <laughs> and so <laughs> I believe community, you know, when you reach out to me, Sen, I was mm. very pleased to join uh, this event because I know mm. that sharing is a very mm. important part because with sharing, we learn from each other mm. and mm. we help each other emotionally. Thank mm. you. Thank you, Wendy. Um, Susan, do you want to say something? No? Oh, okay. Well, I can't hear you. Yeah, you're mute. On muted. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. Um, I would definitely agree with Wendy. Um, I about sharing, and I also feel that by participating in this, it helps to take away the stigma of being different you know, or, or, you know, having an illness that makes you look different, you know, over time. And by sharing some of the routines that you do, you're sharing part of your life. And um, I think it's helpful for people to see that, that, as you've said, it's work to take care of yourself, but it's worth it. And and it's necessary, and I think it's important to get it out there. So I, I applaud you and glad you invited me to be a part of your work. Thank, thank you, um, and, and thank you everyone. And as I mentioned, like doing this project, um, 
I receive so much, you know, um, I think this is something like I, I, you know, I, I think we, 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 there's a lot of wisdom that is being shared. There is a lot of, um, and I think, I mean, that's also why I thought about having this as a topic, you know, um, I think by showing some of our humanness, like what Vanessa said, you know, uh, it is, it takes courage, um, but at the same time, it shows uh, a lot of strength, um, kind of navigating, you know, between the personal um, and the public sphere. So, um, and I think I was able to get out, you know, um, also because of you all, you know. Um, so, yeah, thank you. Um, and, oh, wow, the time passes really fast. <laughs> yeah. Yes, thank you, uh, San. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for all the participants for sharing these beautiful, inspiring stories. At this time, um, Cecile, if you can just share the screen. And I do have a couple announcements of where you can find this project um, and some other announcements. If you have questions, we will have a time to do a Q&A. We might go a little bit over because we have some great questions. So feel free to stay or leave at eight, but just know we'll have that time. Um, but so where you can find the project is routineasrepertoire.com. It is a beautiful site. Son worked extremely hard on it. And it's just a beautiful compilation of the light paintings and the videos and interviews and stories of a few of the women you heard from tonight and the other women and non-binary folks that Son um, worked with on this project. And then the next slide. And it doesn't stop there. Um, this is an ongoing live work that Sun is working on. She's, she is accepting submissions, whether that's in drawing, audio, video, dance, writing. Um, and you can submit at the link repertoire.com or email at um, routinusrepertoire at gmail.com and work with Sun to put together this work, I love it because it, it normalizes um, these transformations and these changes that we don't often see. And so, um, yes, take, this is a, a group effort of public work. And so really excited um, that San is continuing to work. Um, yeah, and I see and this is Wendy's new submission. Yeah. <laughs> if you yeah, wanted yeah, to this, mention that. <laughs> yes, I wanted to say this is uh, Wendy's uh, submission. And I, I love that video that she, she made. Mm -hmm. um, and, and as I mentioned, like, you know, please, you know, share this with your friends and your community. Um, I think, you know, it's like, it's great to see. I mean, actually, after the website went out, I received emails, you know, and people feel that, oh, I saw somebody doing routines that I do. And um, I feel, you know, less lonely um, mm -hmm. viewing that. So uh, I really hope you can share this and, you know, get more people to submit uh, to it. And I would kind of do a little like archive um, of, of these routines. And then lastly, um, before we get into our Q&A, this again is um, in conjunction with the Borderline Exhibition at Angel's Gate. So if you wanted to know more about the exhibition as a whole, um, you can visit angelsgateart.org and click on Borderline. And that's where you'll find um, all of the other works that, will, that are being shown. Um, and San also is showing another work um, mm. as well. So please check us out there. And without further ado, let's get into the questions. So I do have one question directed to Susan. Um, she says, thank you for these beautiful, inspiring uh, stories and art. Susan, I'm wondering how your artwork has changed as your body has transformed. Well, I, one of the things I didn't mention is that I collect, I, I, and you probably see from some of the photograph, one of the photographs Sun showed, I save materials for my treatment. So as time has gone on, I've had more treatments. I tried more treatments. So I have a lot more, um, more, I have a larger palette to work from. Um, so it's, in some ways it's, kind of exciting um, and um, I'm exploring different things. I'm even venturing into 
collage. Um, and, and I would say some of my artwork, um, yeah, I, that, that, that's the biggest thing is that I have more to work with. Thank you, Susan. You're welcome. Um, the next couple of questions, well, the next question's for Son. Um, well, I'll, I'll start with this one. What was the most valuable thing you learned from completing this project that you didn't know before? You started it, did anything surprise you? Um, I, well, I think I went to the project really not knowing uh, what to expect. Um, I, I, you know, I mean, one thing that surprised me was um, that, you know, so many people were willing to participate. <laughs> um, and I think I went in, you know, I, I didn't dare to have too much of expectation because I feel a lot of it is, you know, what I think I would maybe hope to see, you know, um, as, you know, like, I think I was, I wanted to find that connection, you know, um, so therefore I started this project, but it's always, I always feel like, oh, this is in my own mind. I do not how people know how people relate to it. Um, so, so I think, you know, it did nothing really like surprise me except how much I gained out of it. You know, how much I really enjoyed the conversations with um, every single one of the women and even up, you know, with other people who I'm talking about the work with. So there are women that um, I spoke to, but, you know, didn't uh, participate, didn't, I didn't film them, but I had great conversations. Um, so I think, yeah, so I think, you know, that is something um, that I think really also like my practice and really this, this what makes me think about um, and solidify what I find important in my art practice and what do I want to make, the kind of work that I want to make. Um, I think it clarifies a lot of things. It gives me um, confidence. Uh, uh, yeah. So. And San, what is your next step? I mean, we kind of already discussed yeah. it, but what do you, where do you see this work uh, headed? What's your vision? I. I I hope to, um, I mean, I would like to see the work in the physical space, uh, you know, at some point, you know, I feel that the work could be installed. Um, but at the, mainly, I hope that the work can create conversations like this. And I think, you know, and the conversations could be, could go multiple direction. And I like that the work can talk about a range of things. So, so having conversation is important for me. And I feel that the work is just a, a, a catalyst for, for that. You know, it's not like the work shouldn't, should live, have a life of its own. It's, you know, it's not me, like it's not my work anymore. Um, that's what I hope. May I say something to say? Yes. You know, we all been through something and I see this project as a community hmm. project. You know, you know, the eyes can uh, do without the nose and the hands cannot do without the fingers. Just stay encouraged. And it's not saying that you're ever not going through something, but look up, look up. When you're going through something, maybe the great master is telling you to take a right <laughs> turn. So be encouraged. Yeah, thank you, Vivian. <laughs> so much, so beautiful, so much wisdom. <laughs> thank you, Vivian. Um, and then I have one more question here, and it's directed to anyone who wants to answer. So could you share how participating in this project deepened or continue to shift your experience of care and routines? So essentially, how did this project and participating with San and speaking on and going through this process deepen your experience or shift your routine? So anyone can answer this. 
Yeah, P Pika, you are muted. Pika, Pika, I can't hear you. I'm such a teacher, I, I always put my hand up before. <laughs> <laughs> before I speak. <laughs> um, um, but that's a really good question. Uh, I feel like um, in speaking to San and participating in this project, um, there was a lot of clarity that was gained uh, for us as you know what we went through, how we you know, recover from it. Because a lot of the things, they become part of our routine, but we don't really think about it. So it was kind of the metacognitive activity around that, where we understood what we were doing, why we were doing it, how we had done it. Um, the instincts became things that we could articulate rather than uh, things that we just did. Um, I know I was more cognizant maybe than most, um, maybe because I work in this field and I work with occupational therapists and physiotherapists, so maybe I was more aware than the average uh, patient who goes through this, but um, I, I gained a lot of clarity and it, it changed my routines to the point where I started to become very much more mindful of how I was moving, what I was doing, and whether I was impeding my progress or whether I was um, enhancing it. So that really changed for me. So thank you, Sam, and thank you to everybody for thank sharing you. amazing shares. Yeah, so I think that thank Robin you. Robbins was right, you know, the make your mess your message. <laughs> We're all doing that. Make your mess your message. <laughs> yeah, it's quite good. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak to that question? How has this process changed your routine? Has it deepened your um, understanding of your condition, your routine? Yeah, hi, Vanessa speaking. Um, when I was preparing to do um, the filming stuff, I really had to sit down and think about what does routine mean to me, especially as a dancer, because sometimes we do things without thinking about it and sort of what Pika was saying, like, we don't really think about it like that, you know, we just do it automatically. And I just remember sitting and just kind of honoring the fact that I've done so much in my life because of these routines, it's guided me to be where I am now. And it, I definitely feel like more appreciative of my own self for guiding my body to where it is now. And I think that's incredibly special. And then just seeing like that work coming into fruitation and still ongoing. Um, I find myself um, in my classes, like really like appreciating that I'm waking up and doing what I need to do in order to continue my process throughout my life. So thank you so much for involving me in this beautiful project, Sensei. Thank you, thank you, Vanessa. Um, and I think one one discussion that I was we, we were talking about in, for Vanessa is like it her routines really you know um, prepare her for the rigor of um, you know the professional dancing, like so doing all these things like you just need to prep your body you know for this high level kind of uh, work. Yeah. Um, Anyone else? Well, I see that I can implement some of this when I have my board meetings, you know, and everything. Um, I failed to tell you guys that I was a commissioner of Riverside for four years with people with disabilities. And so I would go to city council to, to speak on behalf of people with disabilities. Now I'm with a uh, commissioner for human relations. So I see a lot of stuff I uh, can implement when I go to my meetings and my uh, do my board meetings. And I thank you for inviting me. I've always thought about where are you? <laughs> and, and I want to say, uh, Angel Gate, I worked there when it wasn't Angel Gate. I was making a dollar and 27 cents an hour at Fort Mac out there. <laughs> wow. <laughs> 
Yeah, I remember you were somewhere in San Pedro. Um, yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, like in, in central. Right, right. Center. Yeah. So um, thank you, Vivian. Anyone else wants to say anything? I'm going to jump in quickly, um, kind of tying back to the question I was asked to. They didn't completely answer, but I think, um, you know, focusing what Pika was saying, you know, focusing on these routines. And as my body has changed, um, I have to really be. Sorry. Um, really be cognizant of my energy level. And therefore, I have to, to do things more efficiently. So I do have to rely on routines more, you know, whether it be in the morning laying out my clothes right next, you know, near my bed so I'm not hunting all over my bedroom for the clothes because I don't have the bandwidth, if you will, to do that um, kind of work. Or when I take a shower, making sure I have everything I need going in. You know, I, ha I just have to be that much more efficient and routines become that much more important to me. So I wanted to add that and it, it does, all into my art as well and that all my materials and everything need to be close by so I'm not you know hunting all over the place find everything so I wanted to add that thank you <laughs> okay thank you so much everyone uh, to our panelists for sharing your stories and for San for initiating this work there's one more question that just oh, came in. There's one more. Oh, there we <laughs> go. Okay, let's see. <laughs> Thanks for catching that. Um, in what ways has oh okay? In what ways has COVID impacted your relationship to routine, if any? What advice would you give to people now struggling to maintain a routine because of the global pandemic? Pandemic. So maybe one or two um, of our panelists can can answer that question. Uh, Vanessa. Vanessa. Thank you for that question, just because I relate to that question deeply because um, I was in the middle of a semester taking all these dance classes and then boom, pandemic hit and it spent, it, it literally made my dance training spiral out of control for the first couple of months because I was pretty much in the grieving process to the fact that I couldn't dance with my walker in a large space and I had to confine myself in my small space. And one of the things that I was talking to um, Sam Sit with is the fact that it kind of felt like a full circle now that I look back at it because when I started dance, it was in my other um, apartment where I used to live and it was, a, it was in a tiny space as well. That's where I started discovering dance for my disabled body and so looking at through that lens I started to play again like how can I make and manipulate my tiny space to start doing work start choreographing and doing these different things um it takes a moment and I think the greatest advice right now um is to know that it's okay if you fall out of your routine it's not it's okay because our mental health is so vital and just know that you're not alone. Um, I know a lot of us, especially for those of us who have different medical conditions, disabilities, it's really hard for us to go out. Um, just know that there's a community out there, um, reach out and um, we're gonna get through this as a community. I, I strongly believe that. Um, so yeah, those are my thoughts for that question. Thank you. Maybe just one more, one more person to answer that question. Well, for me, oh. when we found out that COVID was going on, 
I have two hips replacement. And I thought I had to go because my hips start getting stiff. And so finally they made up a schedule for us, every other uh, person in a lane. So I was glad I was able to swim. And Wendy, uh, I think Wendy has something to say, right? She was, is, is mute again. Hi, um, yes, I think, uh, you know, th the COVID-19 is a new, new normal for us because when I have, I'm diagnosed with cancer, it's a new normal and we have adjusted, I have adjusted to it. And so when the COVID turned up, um, I couldn't, uh, in the beginning, it's a bit, uh, a lot of restriction. However, uh, walking, it's, uh, very repetitive and uh, you can actually walk more times in your balcony or up the stairs down the stairs you know and so uh, we have to change our routine but I would recommend walking because walking is the most inexpensive no equipment required although it's very underrated but to me walking is fantastic I lost 50 kg or 110 pounds, uh, you know, over the years because of this walking. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I feel like we could talk for forever, but we are a little over time. And thank you for everyone for sticking around for the Q and A portion. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you, Son Angels Gate, um, and I'll pass it off to Cecilia for some closing words. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us today and thank you for going a little over time. I think it was really important to continue that conversation. Uh, I just want to thank Naomi and San and all of our artists, some who have come from different parts of the world. Um, Vivian, it's so amazing that you were at Angel's Gate years ago and now you're back in a new way. I think that's yes. amazing and wonderful. Um, I did share some links to learn more about Routine is Repertoire. Please click that link and look more in depth um, at this wonderful, uh, beautiful art project uh, by San. But I hope everyone has a fantastic night. And uh, thank you all again. And thank you to uh, DCA Department of Cultural Affairs uh, who sponsored uh, the Borderline exhibition. And that is also available online. So thank you very much, everyone. Have thank you. a great night. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye, son. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. We'll talk soon. Bye. Thank, thank you. you.